objectives. Um, firstly, uh, is the, the first objective will be to understand the definition of normal labor, and then uh, to review the stages of normal labor, as well as to discuss the management of normal labor. Then uh, to integrate the clinical evidence and expertise, as well as to review what is known already about um, patient needs and values. So what is normal labor? WHO Technical Working Group uh, defines normal labor as spontaneous regular contractions, causing fetus and placental expulsion. expulsion. And this occurs at 37 to 42 weeks, and it remains a low risk throughout. And um, the fetus has to be in cephalic presentation, and at the end, there has to be good maternal and uh, neonate condition. So, initially, WHO recognized active labor as um, cervical dilatation of uh, three centimeters going forward. But this changed in 2018 when they did the um, WHO labor care guideline. So. Well, initially, um, the 1992 Jordan um, WHO pathograph uh, was designed for developing countries. And it divided labor into two um, two sections, the latent phase and the active uh, phase. The latent phase being the eight hour uh, initial part, followed by uh, active phase from three centimeters dilatation, going forward with a dilatation rate of um, one centimeter per hour or more. When active phase was slow, we would intervene at four hour mark and we would use the alert line and the, act, uh, the action line for analysis of how labor is progressing. So this gave more like a, a picture where you could have an eyeball of what exactly is happening with the patient. And um, in uh, 2013, uh, Lavender and colleagues showed that um, interventions at the two hour marker compared to the interventions that uh, four hours marker had no impact on the C-section rates. And they also advised that uh, the pathograph should not be used in standard uh, management of labor. So the heading is not showing, but at the top there is WHO labor care guideline. This is the the, the, the new WHO pathograph, which starts um, plotting at uh, five centimeter dilatation of the cervix. And you can see if the patient comes in with um, a cervical dilatation of five centimeters, you are going to check the cervix about six hours later. Then uh, if they came with um, a, a cervix dilatation of six, Review is at five hours. If it was seven, review is at three hours. If it was eight, um, review is at two and a half hours. If uh, the dilatation was nine, review is at um, two hours. So it's on uh, that column at the other side. But the rest of it is pretty much similar to what is on the previous pathograph. pathograph. So research that influenced uh, these changes that we're seeing, um, the article that was written by Cecil M. Begley in 2014 showed that um, the interventions um, that we do in labor have benefits, and uh, most of them do cause uh, morbidity as well. And um, Aldapo and colleagues, in 2017 showed that um, a cervical dilatation of one hour per hour, it's unrealistic as um, different patients um, progress differently. And in uh, um, 2018, 
uh, the Cochrane database review, uh, also by Lavender and colleagues, had shown that the, the patrogram had no proven improvement on um, labor outcomes. So the other articles that are there, there is one by uh, Solomon Johnston, which showed uh, that uh, normal delivery does okay at 37 to uh, 42 weeks. And uh, Finai and colleagues uh, talked about the timing of admission, timing for admission, which is unclear, and um, that you do admit the patients who are in labor. So before we go into the management of labor, I would like us to review briefly the physiology of um, labor, physiology of normal labor. And with this, I'll start off with uh, dividing parturition itself into four phases. With the first phase being the most part of the, the pregnancy itself, like 95% of the, the pregnancy. And this will be followed by phase two, um, where we start seeing changes. And uh, phase three is mostly the three stages of labor. And that will be followed by phase four, which is recovery, or what we normally call the fourth stage of labor. So phase one is the preparatory phase. Like I said, it's 95% of the pregnancy itself. So this is 36 to 38 weeks um, of pregnancy, where the myometrium is in quiescence uh, state. It's unresponsive, but uh, it's actively, uh, the, the smooth muscle cells are actively working and growing. So this phase is regulated by the neural, the endocrine, the paracrine, and the autocrine signals. And um, quiescence is maintained by the balance or the ratio between progesterone and uh, estrogen mainly. And the myometrial cells, plasma membrane receptor mediated increase in uh, CANP. As well, the generation of uh, CGMP, which uh, works with uh, prostaglandins, also it's um, also involved in this state as well. So there is a balance between the relaxation and the um, contraction, or relaxation and the contraction of the smooth muscle cells, which is by the peptide hormone transcription of uh, the key genes in the, smooth, in the smooth muscle cells. So after the quiescent stage follows the um, transitional phase where unresponsiveness is suspended. And this leads to cervical, um, uh, the, the, the cervical ripening and effacement and also loss of uh, cohesion. So there is change in the matrix of the, uh, the, the, the cervix, the stroma of the cervix itself. So now this brings about initiation of labor and the three contemporary theories which um, aim to, um, which aim to, 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 to elucidate how labor starts. So the first theory states that um, there is some um, loss of pregnancy maintenance factors so, like I said before, the balance between progesterone and um, estrogen, the ratios, um, maintain the quiescence, uh, the quiescence of uh, the uterus. Then towards the end of the pregnancy, there is progesterone withdrawal, which shifts the, 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 the balance of the scale, which shifts the ratio, leading to initiation of um, labor. So, this was also it is in part supported by the work that was done by Wolf in 1993, where it, uh, it showed that mifepristone softened the cervix, and also it increased the um, sensitivity of uh, uretonins, um, the smooth muscle cells sensitivity to uretonins. So in 2015, uh, Patel also showed that um, the Estrogen receptor alpha and beta, as well as the progesterone receptors A and B, 
uh, acted on uh, the nuclear receptors, causing gene transcription leading to initiation of uh, labor. Then the other theory states that um, synthesis of uh, inducing factors also leads to initiation of labor. So here we're talking about um, the decidual becoming reactive or activated uh, and releasing prostaglandins and contributing also to the initiation of labor. Um, the smooth muscle cells also have a, a paracrine activity because the, the smooth muscle cells are plastic cells. So they have capacity to differentiate um, as the pregnancy continues and some of them will have um, paracrine activity which will at the end of uh, pregnancy contribute to initiation of um, labor. So the other theory says that the fetus could be the source of the signal for induction of uh, or initiation of labor. Now currently research supports um, contribution from all the theories and in the end, uh, there is increased uh, actin and uh, myosin interaction. And this leads to increased uh, smooth muscle cell excitability, as well as increased um, crosstalk between smooth muscle cells, leading to contractions. So this is a summary of um, the, the, the process that I said uh, involved the theories that are, are involved in uh, initiation of labor, the fetus being the signal, the mother there, and the placenta also being the source. So then the phase three of parturition, it's uh, mostly labor itself, there's three stages of labor. And here I'd like to briefly talk about the mechanisms of labor, which um, mostly the, the positional um, changes that the presenting part uh, attain uh, while navigating through the pelvic canal. So fetal lie and presentation determine the mode of delivery. And also, adding to this, um, the work done by Negat in 2015 showed that the pelvis also changes in, in adoption for normal vaginal delivery. This was in part uh, supported by the work that was done by Ster Yance 2015 and uh, colleagues, where they did a series of um, uh, transperineal ultrasound monitoring and they evaluated the bladder neck motility and they also looked at the size of the hiatus at 21 weeks uh, gestation and also at uh, 37 weeks gestation also postpartum they looked at it at six weeks uh, uh, postpartum and six months postpartum then a year later this is for patients who delivered uh, vaginally and they found that um, at 37 weeks gestation and at six weeks postpartum, there was the largest uh, increase in the high tals, um, area. And at uh, six months postpartum, the perineum perineal muscles have, had kind of recovered and they were comparable to the state at uh, 21 uh, weeks gestation. But going forward, there was no further improvement. Now, with this, Nugget um, classified or coined that um, vaginal delivery is a traumatic event. So now this slide just shows the, the mechanisms of labor. Unfortunately, it goes up and down, up and down, uh, number three and number four. 
uh, on the other slide, but basically it just shows uh, engagement, descent, uh, flexion, internal rotation, extension and expulsion of the uh, fetal head as it navigates through the birth canal. So that's number one, number two, number three, number four, seven, and like that. Okay. So now we can go on and look into the management of uh, normal labor, which is the topic of today. Most of my reference will be from Willard's Obstetrics uh, 25th edition, published in 2018, unless we're uh, stated. So now, birth is a normal and physiological event, but complications should be anticipated. And uh, for us to be able to anticipate them, we have to be able to identify labor. And uh, Parkland Hospital um, identified labor or diagnosed labor when the patient had uh, five contractions per minute with rupture of membranes or if uh, they were having uh, per-vaginal bleeding, and also if they had a cervical dilatation of uh, four centimeters or more. So this was published by uh, Pates and colleagues. And still with uh, that as the diagnosis of labor, they advised that um, admission should be earlier for patients who are at high risk, um, who are already known with the condition, which puts them as a high risk patient. Then, Balit and colleagues showed that um, admission of patients in um, active phase was better than uh, admitting patients in uh, latent phase of labor because admitting patients in latent phase of labor led to higher rates of arrest, higher rates of cesarean section, and also higher rates of uh, chorioamnionitis. Then um, we, we need to evaluate the patients so that we know um, whether to admit or not. So there is an initial evaluation as the patient comes in. And here we look into the patient's vitals. We look at the fetal conditions, or the heart rate mainly. And we look at the maternity booklet and assess the cervix, um, check the booking blast, and if there are any uh, tests that needs to be done at that point, um, we can do them, uh, especially hemoglobin and maybe uh, urine dipsticks. And this will indicate if we need to do further lab tests. So after the initial evaluation for patients who meet the criteria for admission, they get the general examination and we also review the results, which we would have done at the initial um, evaluation. Then we plan for delivery and monitoring. If uh, there are no any other uh, complications or anything that we picked up. The maternal monitoring is four hourly. And if uh, the membranes have ruptured, it is advisable to monitor the um, maternal temperature each and every hour. In uh, 2017, um, ACOG specified the um, optimal anesthetic use in obstetrics. This is for pain control but it depends on uh, patient needs. And also, they've said uh, the chronic medications and first stage of labor needs to be continued. So there's no need to withhold uh, chronic meds in first stage of labor. But in second stage of labor, when the patient is actively pushing, um, oral intake and medications should not be taken as uh, the uh, distribution and absorption rates are altered. So now she Vastava and colleagues also showed that um, glucose requirements in labor are significant. Uh, they said that uh, they're equivalent to 
the need of someone who's running a marathon. So a laboring mom in first stage of labor needs to be eating. Uh, if there is any reason why she shouldn't be eating, we have to give her IV uh, dextrose, 5% uh, dextrose. Um, in 2017, the American uh, Pediatric Academy and uh, the ACOG um, advised that uh, fetal monitoring of uh, low-risk mumps or low-risk fetuses should be done uh, in the first stage of labor, should be done every 30 minutes or after every contraction. But for high-risk patients, um, the monitoring is every 15 minutes in the first stage of uh, labor. But in second stage of labor, monitoring is every 15 minutes for low-risk patients and five uh, minutes for high-risk patients. But in our settings where there is shortage of staff, you'll find that uh, continuous monitoring is what we normally do because intermittent uh, monitoring, even though it will save resources, wouldn't be feasible. Um, the use of uh, penicillin in uh, laboring moms is only indicated if the mom is a GVS carrier. This uh, is published in the ACOP committee 2020. Um, in uh, 2013, uh, Smith and colleagues published on the Cochrane database that uh, amniotomy is a risk for infection, so it should not be routinely used. And it can also lead to cord prolapse. So unless if we're inducing for reasons that are indicated, amniotomies should not be done. Then why do we monitor these patients even though we say it's a low risk um, uh, patient? Well, the thing is, um, there is evidence that 29% of the low-risk pregnancies do develop complications intrapartum. So there's a 29% chance of uh, developing complications. So this was published by Dan Lick and colleagues in 2015 on the American Journal of uh, Ops and Gain. So that's why we monitor. So management of second stage of labor. So second stage of labor uh, starts from a 10 centimeter dilatation of the cervix. And um, Dimasio and colleagues uh, found evidence that pushing or advising the mom to push immediately reduces the uh, length of the second stage. Then uh, Bloom and colleagues uh, also show that uh, coaching shortens the second stage of labor. Then uh, in uh, 2018, Begal um, did research and it led up to showing that the upright positions um, in labor reduces the second stage of labor as well and also they lead to reduced uh, need or performed uh, Episiotomies. So they, they, they lead to the need for episiotomies and uh, operational vaginal delivery. But uh, still, these positions led to high rates of um, postpartum hemorrhage and also second degree lacerations. Then, still on second stage of labor, perineal care um, is advised. Now, the, for perineal care, even though I've written massage reduces uh, trauma, this is not done during labor. Um, perineal massage is something that is done in preparation for labor, before labor is done, uh, before labor starts. So this uh, was published on the Cochrane Review by Beckman and Stock. So third stage of labor management of third stage of labor. Now third stage of labor is uh, delivery of the placenta and the membranes mainly. So before cutting the cord, um, the uh, American Academic Academy of Pediatricians and ACOG uh, found that uh, it is advisable to delay cord lamping. 
by at least 30 seconds. So uh, neonates who had cord clamping delayed had uh, higher hematocrits when reviewed at six months um, of life as compared to the ones which, um, or who, since now it's humans, who did not get uh, cord clamping. So then after the clamping and the cutting of the cord, uh, we can uh, manage the third stage of labor by uh, active delivery of the placenta. So this has been shown to reduce the chances of postpartum hemorrhage, and it's by the work done by Galman Zul and colleagues in 2013, as published on uh, PubMed. Then skin-to-skin -skin placement uh, has been shown to increase bonding between the mother and the neonate, and also encourages breastfeeding, early breastfeeding, leading to control of hypoglycemia in um, neonates. So this has been published in uh, Cochrane Database 2016. Um, after delivery of the, of the placenta and membranes, the placenta itself is examined and the perineal assessment has to be done. Then the instruments and swabs have to be counted. Next, uh, what follows will be completion of uh, fourth stage of labor. So WHO postnatal care guidelines of 2015 advises that uh, all, birth, all births that are carried in a health facilities, the mom and the neonate have to be reviewed at, at an hour mark. And for births that occurred outside the healthcare facility, uh, the patient should ideally be reviewed within 24 hours, so they should present within 24 hours. Then uh, we, we observe the healthy mo mothers for 24 hours, and they can be discharged early if bleeding is controlled and there are no any other complications, no signs of infection. And afterwards, after sending the patient home, there should at least be four postnatal um, follow-ups within uh, six weeks. So the first one is the the one that was done post immediate postnatal. Then uh, three days later, there should be another follow-up. Then another follow-up should be between seven days and fourteen days. Then the fourth one should be the six-week. Uh, Postpartum. It has been shown that lots of uh, maternal uh, mortalities happen in this period if this is not instituted. So the NICE guidelines of uh, 2021, published in April, suggested an individualized discharge plan into a community midwife. So the patient should be discharged to community midwives. Then, still on post, uh, on uh, fourth stage, and the patient needs to be counseled on the outcomes of uh, the pregnancy and the delivery. And during this counseling, we should talk to them about postpartum care, uh, involving the physical, mental, and the nutritional aspects. We should not also forget to talk to them about family planning and um, talking about the next pregnancy. If they need to book early, this is the time to tell them why. And yes. So now the patient expectations can be found on that website, the ncbi.nlm.inh.gov. So patient expectations should be understood. They should be respected. We should know our patient's wishes and fears, uh, uh, security concerns, and uh, self-esteem issues. We should address the patient needs, be it medical, be it psychological, um, physiological, and we should give the patient information. The ultimate aim is uh, 
positive uh, birth experience for both uh, the healthcare giver, healthcare provider, and the patient. And with this regard, uh, birth companions have been shown, um, or having a birth companion in the delivery suit has been shown to reduce the need for analgesia and also reduce the uh, operations uh, needs like cesarean sections mainly. So there are protocols on management of labor. Uh, the first one that I'll talk about is the Dublin, Dublin 1984 protocol by O'Driscoll and colleagues. We show that uh, management of active labor lowered uh, diagnosis of labor dystocia and also decreased the C-section rates. So with this, um, they diagnosed labor as uh, presence of contraction with full effacement of the cervix uh, with show or rupture of membranes. So the patients were confined to bed within 12 hours and the cervix was evaluated hourly for three hours, then every two hours. If dilatation was less than uh, a centimeter per an hour, oxytocin was started. And if the patient came without rupture of membranes, um, they would rupture membranes and assess the cervix as such. But if the patient uh, came with uh, rupture of membranes already from home, um, they will uh, start oxytocin or they started oxytocin uh, on admission. So in 1992, Lopez Zeno and uh, colleagues showed that uh, this management did in fact uh, lower the cesarean section rates and they compared it to the traditional um, management of labor. So the rates are comparable as you can see, 10% um, with um, active management and 14.1% with traditional management. In uh, 2013, Wei and colleagues um, published on the Cochrane uh, Database Review that uh, active management of labor had a modest reduction in uh, cesarean section uh, rates. Uh, before then, Frigletto and colleagues, as well as Brown, showed that uh, active management of labor shortened the labor itself but did not have any impact on uh, C-section rates. Then the other protocol that's there that exists is the Parkland Hospital Protocol. Uh, with it, uh, in Parkland, they admitted patients who had ruptured of membranes or who had a cervical dilatation of three to four centimeters. Then they would examine the cervix every two hours. If there was no dilatation, they would do a rupture of membranes, then monitor the, uh, or evaluate the cervix again at uh, two hours. If no progress, they put the interuterine pressure gauge in catheter. And if uh, the contractions were still not effective at two hour mark, then they started oxytocin. The goal here was contraction of, uh, contractions of 200 to 250 Montevideo units at uh, two, two to four hours before dystocia was diagnosed. So a cervical dilatation of um, one to two centimeter per an hour uh, was accepted and cesarean sections will be considered after eight hours of instituting this management. So this was evaluated on more than 20,000 uh, low risk patients and um, it was found to reduce this, the need for cesarean sections and it did not have any uh, bad outcomes on the fetus or the neonate. This should be my last slide. Thank you.
doesn't really support the use of the Parker Dam. And oh. Parker and Garth Events Review published in 2019 says that they are unsure of the benefits of the Parker Dam. Oh. So based on that, um, what is your opinion of the use of the Parker Dam in our setting and should we continue with it? Okay. So I'm of the opinion that we should use the, the patogram. Sorry, where is it now? The thing is, um, the level of, um, or the availability of resources in our settings is uh, not as the same as in developed uh, countries. Because when they will say they're not using the patrogram, what do they have in, in place? They have ultrasound. They can do intrapatram uh, ultrasound monitoring, which is not a modality that we can use. And if you take our labor ward, for example, right now, we only have one ultrasound machine, and we have like how many mamas laboring a lot. And also the um, staff uh, to patient ratio that we have, if we had more ultrasound machines, who will be doing this ultrasound monitoring? But if you have a pathogram, you have a midwife, and you have uh, medical officers of different levels who have um, the, the ability to plot and give a, 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 an eyeball picture. Like if you come and review the patient later, you can see if the patient is progressing or not. So I will say in our setting, yes. program lecture to pre-grad students many, many times a year, and I, that's why I sort of have to think about it all the time because you get the most interesting questions always from the pre-grad students. So the first thing is, yes, there's no evidence probably about the program used, but that is, they, they focus on sort of the one-on-one, -on -one, on one-on-two type of care. And the program is still a universal tool that has use in places with resource limitations. For sure, as long as it's used properly. Because it's supposed to be easy on one page, you're supposed to, with a glance, be able to pick up the, the main problem, which should be poor progress in labor, which is a common problem specifically in developing countries. But, the, but what I want to add is that um, a lot of the developments about labor management and photogram management is actually based on the opposite problem that is more associated with developed countries, okay. and that is the high rate of cesarean sections. So, and, and, and you must all be familiar with the ACOG article and guideline on, on, on how to avoid the primary cesarean section, and that feeds a lot into all of this sort of evidence-based labor management because ma many of those developments have been put in place and sort of get attention because they want to get us closer to physio understanding for normal physiology of labor so that we can avoid this overuse of cesarean section. So it's almost like this competing problem in, in developing countries, lots of long labors, obstructive labors, and all of those complications. And a photogram is a relative straightforward way to pick up when a labor is prolonged. But in a place where the problem is too many seizures, a photogram is not as obvious. And the whole shift from prolonging the definition of first stage of labor to, in America they recommend six centimeters, but we have, we, in South Africa we say five centimeters. One of the main reasons for that is because there's bigger bodies of evidence now supporting that that's more in line with normal labor, and we want to avoid coming on, you know, coming into a place the next morning and then they discuss a series of the night and then we're not being with also long first phase, a uh, latent phase of the first stage of labor. Um, so yeah, so just a, the link between yes, those two things. And how it all fits together, it sort of made sense to me only after I gave the lecture like 50 times and then I was like, oh, so that's how it all fit in together. So yeah, so I just wanted to add that. Thank you, Karen. Any further comments or questions? Thank you for your preparation. Centimeters. It's 
sort of seems to assume that obstructive labor doesn't exist or can't happen within a six hour window and I would not actually agree with that unless I saw the evidence conflicting with that. I know you don't expect her necessarily to be fully dilated for four, six yeah. hours, but she could have severe caput and molding at mm. seven centimeters and you would completely miss that if you had such a frequent examination. So what is the evidence that that is based on? So the, 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 the work that they've done, I don't have it uh, on this presentation for why it was formulated like that. I just have it as it is. So that's on the WHO. It's on the WHO autogram. But for our oh, South African medical guidelines say four centimeters. Four hours. Yeah. But also, that this is one of the questions I get asked the most by midwives in the photogram lecture. Because in reality, even in lower setups, they assess the patients. Well, the, the midwives feel that what they do and what they aim for is to assess the patient every two hours, even the lower patients. So they feel when I present to them to do it four hourly lower patients, they even feel uncomfortable with that. So I think the question is more about two or four hourly. I was sort of, I don't think we have. We don't we, we that don't. we are. Yeah, we don't. don't even in low resource settings, there's never been a discussion around six hourly in our context that I have attended. 